So I think it's pretty likely that most, if not all of us, have had dinosaur books growing up. Many of which, paleontologically speaking, either are kind of outdated now, or just simply weren't really correct for the time. I have already taken a look at two of my childhood books, that being of course these two right here, and you, you guys seem to really like those because those videos did decently well. So you know, I figured I'd go ahead and continue that trend and search for more of my childhood books. One that I you know found a while ago that I'd definitely like to talk about is this one. Dinosaurs, called Simply. We have a very interesting dromaeosaur design, just like clashing straight through solid steel and kind of like vampire teeth up here. Very, very interesting design. Like that's definitely an eye catcher. You know, if you want your book to get sold, take some notes. Now, when I was, you know, going through this book initially, I, I found that there's really not a lot that's accurate at all. You know, even for the time, like a lot of this is pretty bad. Um, this book was done by Igloo. Um, and it says right here that it's sold as part of a set. I don't know if that means like, you know, this is the one book of the dinosaur series, or maybe it's like, you know, maybe there's one on space or something like that. Who knows? But anyway, we're looking at the dinosaur one and uh, let's get into it. Now, the first page is pretty common with dinosaur books, like especially a lot of the ones that I've seen in my childhood. And it's like a timeline of the Mesozoic. You know, you get your, uh, uh, your Triassic, your Jurassic, and your Cretaceous period. And they kind of like list a few notable dinosaurs that come from each of those periods, such as, you know, the uh, late... Uh, the late Cretaceous housed things like T-Rex, Edmontosaurus, Hadrosaurus, or uh, Velociraptor, all that good stuff. One notable thing is that it does mention that like towards the end of the Triassic is when like the first dinosaur started to appear. Pretty correct. So right now we're off to a pretty decent start, all things considered, geological time period wise. Not bad. But then we get the first page. And, you know, the book's called Dinosaurs, right? It's very clearly about dinosaurs. So you would probably guess that at the very least, the first page would be a dinosaur. It's not. It's an ichthyosaur, which is not a dinosaur. It's a marine reptile. Little little rule of thumb. If it's completely aquatic, then it's not a dinosaur. That You know, that goes for sharks, mosasaurs, pliosaurs, plesiosaurs, and ichthyosaurs. Um, but, you know, in terms of this little CGI render, it's not bad. Like, I feel like Ichthyosaur is like one of those few creatures that has just relatively remained the same. Because, I mean, of course, we've had a lot of uh, skeletal material of them, so it's kind of hard for them to change over time. But they've remained decently consistent. They almost look like a reptilian dolphin, uh, which is a really cool example of like convergent evolution, where it's like two different animals evolve similar... Uh, characteristics from like completely independently from each other and ichthyosaurs and dolphins are a great example because of course they really don't share any close relation at all you know one being a marine mammal one being a marine reptile but they have similar characteristics like an elongated snout uh, the dorsal fin and you know fun things like that I will also note note that it mentions that ichthyosaurs give live birth this is true. We have found many examples of the ichthyosaur babies like still within the mothers basically during the fossilization process. They're pretty like they're pretty cool and kind of one in a million fossils, but yeah, they definitely do exist. So yeah, that is true. But then after that, we get the very famous tyrant lizard king itself, that being the Tyrannosaurus rex. It, you know, it's an interesting uh render. It's uh those feet look strange. They don't look bird-like at all. <laughs> Um, it has an interesting head shape. It feels like it takes a lot of inspiration from, from um, uh, Jurassic Park, of course. But one big notable thing about this little render is the fact that it's attacking a Styracosaurus. That is pretty strange because Tyrannosaurus rex and Styracosaurus wouldn't have met each other. Um, having Triceratops there definitely would have made a lot more sense because, of course, Triceratops was on T-Rex's menu. Um, there's also a, on the top left corner, and that's true for all of these animals, there's locations, like locations in which these animals lived. T-Rex, they have it in two locations. One is North America, which is correct. That is where Tyrannosaurus rex hails. And one is... It, well, on here, it's in the ocean, but um, one is supposed to be in Mongolia. Now, I do believe that this, this little placement comes from the fact that there was a point in time where it was kind of questioned whether or not Tarbosaurus, a relative of T-Rex, was actually Tyrannosaurus itself. 
you know, just a different species under the genus of Tyrannosaurus, making it Tyrannosaurus batar. But, you know, later it was found that there was just too many skeletal differences and Tarbosaurus was remained separate from T-Rex. I mean, I think that there are a few who are in favor for it, but the general consensus is that they are completely separate from one another. So this Mongolia placement, of course, is not correct. We'll go ahead and move on to a big one for me. I even talked about this in a TikTok, the Velociraptor page. Um, there's a lot of things wrong with this little render right here. First of all, the, the Velociraptor itself um, definitely looks like the Jurassic Park Raptors, which are themselves based on Deinonychus, uh, Deinonychus anteropus. There's a whole story behind that that I'm sure I could talk about in future videos, but you know, basically right now that, that that's one of the biggest reasons why Deinonychus looks so different to Velociraptor in life or sorry, the Jurassic Park Velociraptor looks different to the real life Velociraptor. Um, but because they took the inspiration from the Jurassic Park, that means none of the, like, the skeletal structure does not match up at all, as well as some things that aren't even true for Deinonychus in this little image, like the lack of feathers, the pronated wrists, and just a lot of things like that, and the shrink wrapping, of course. Uh, yeah, no, it's not a good render at all in on any accounts. And another big one is that they are attacking a time-traveling uh, Stegosaurus now. Of course, Velociraptor lived in Mongolia uh, during the late Cretaceous period, whereas Stegosaurus itself lived in North America during the late Jurassic period, which is several millions of years in between the two of these, like two of them, like the. Plus, like I mentioned, they were on completely different continents. So even if they did live at the same time, an encounter does not seem likely. Not to mention Stegosaurus in life was so much bigger than Velociraptor, but. I digress. Yeah, that's definitely not a not a really good uh, section. After that, though, we have Allosaurus. It's a funky design. I you know it has red lacrimal crests. The crests are actually positioned in the in the correct spot. That being just in front of the eyes. Um, it's it's a you know like I said it's kind of funky. It's a bit shrink wrapped. The wrists are breaking themselves, but. It, you know, I guess it's passable. Um, they, the locations on the map show it coming from North America and Europe. There was a European species of Allosaurus, so that checks out. But one big thing I do want to highlight is this little attacking prey section. They mentioned that it had a, you know, you've probably heard this song and dance before. Allosaurus had a relatively weak bite force. Therefore, it would use a hatchet style hunting method where it would kind of like, it would like open its mouth really wide and its top jaw right here would just kind of slam down on prey. We saw it in documentaries like uh, uh, Planet Dinosaur as well as the very recent Dinosaurs with Stephen Fry. Um, that is not something that has ever really had a life. Like it was proposed and like shot down relatively quick. A, a hunting style like that does not make sense. There's a good chance it could damage its lower jaw, it just it's incredibly impractical for the animal to do something like that um, and plus the bite force was taken from the big owl specimen which was a younger individual so its bite force likely wasn't going to be too strong anywho so in any case no that does not stand um, and the fact that like dinosaurs with Stephen Fry still said it even though it's a recent documentary is just bad you know that's just we don't think that <laughs> but after that we have the Brachiosaurus everybody's favorite one of everybody's favorite sauropod. Um, their design here, of course, looks very reminiscent of old Brachiosaurus depictions. Um, and there's actually a reason for that. That includes this guy right here. Now, Brachiosaurus beforehand was known from very fragmentary remains, the North American Brachiosaurus. It was so fragmentary that we didn't even have a skull. So we didn't, we, you know, we didn't know what its head looked like. But then later, there was another specimen found in Africa that was believed to be another species of Brachiosaurus. And this one was a lot more complete, even containing the skull. And the skull looked like this right here, this Jurassic Park. Brachiosaurus skull. So because it was at the at the time the consensus was that that was another species of Brachiosaurus um, A lot of those traits were brought over to the North American species that happens all the time uh, In paleontology when you have very fragmentary remains you look at a lot of their close relatives to kind of fill in the gaps Essentially, it's it happened. It happens to Spinosaurus all the time since Spinosaurus is so fragmentary We fill in its gaps with other Spinosaurids such as Baryonyx or Suchomimus later It was discovered that the African species of Brachiosaurus had too many skeletal differences to be considered another species of Brachiosaurus and was split into its own genus known as Giraffe Titan. You heard it first here, 
people. Um, the Jurassic Park Brachiosaurus is actually a giraffe titan. Very fun stuff. Yeah, Brachiosaurus had more so, almost like a Camarasaurus style skull, almost. Like, it, it did still have this bump on top, just nearly not as pronounced as Giraffe Titans. But anyway, I'm rambling. Basically, this is like a render of Giraffe Titan. Um, and the top left corner of the map does pretty much confirm this because they have a dot, again, in the ocean. <laughs> but of course, that was meant to be in North America. And they have a dot in Africa where Giraffe Titan hailed. Next up, we have another sauropod, that being Diplodocus. Um, so now these spikes on Diplodocus, you see them quite commonly. It's actually likely that they did have them because close relatives of them had them. So, cool, that holds up. Um, it has a very long, kind of like whip-like tail, and its head is actually elevated a little bit more off the ground instead of being a lot more horizontal, like seen in documentaries like Walking with Dinosaurs. This is true. We didn't. We now know that uh, Diplodocus would be able to lift its head a lot more, like lift it up a lot more vertically, than, rather than being a lot more horizontal like that. So yeah, really not too many complaints about this Diplodocus right here. And now we loop back around to Stegosaurus with a very, very funky model. Now, it, we see this depiction of Stegosaurus a lot where it kind of like arches up towards the hip um, and then you know levels out again for the tail. We now know that Stegosaurus had more so of a horizontal flat back rather than being a lot more arched like this. But they do have things like the osteoderms, of course those being the plates, and the thagomizers, which are those spikes at the end of their tail. But one strange thing about these thagomizers is they have four of them, you know, like Stegosaurus did, but then they have like the tip of the tail is like a thagomizer. Okay, <laughs> all right. And also I do want to point out the map. The map does show Stegosaurus showing up basically all over the world, um, like in Asia, in Africa, in Europe, and of course North America. Stegosaurus itself was native to North America, but other Stegosaurids did of course show up in all of these other locations. But the thing is, is that this page is talking about Stegosaurus. It's not talking about the family of Ste Stegosauridae. Um, it's just talking about Stegosaurus. Like, Europe would be something like Miragaya, or Africa would be like Kentrosaurus or something like that. Not Stegosaurus itself, so that's that's a big thing right there. And then the very famous armored Ankylosaurus, um, of course covered with its osteoderms, having its very famous club at the end of its tail. Um, this design is pretty reminiscent of, I think, when this book was released, which I believe was around 2010. One interesting thing I want to point out is that it does have kind of like an armadillo or turtle back, where it's like kind of like a plate on the back housing some of those osteoderms. Ankylosaurus didn't have this. I, I think it's pretty common to see it like this in earlier depictions, uh, when in reality it just simply had its regular skin texture all over its back, just with osteoderms in it. So it was still incredibly armored, just not looking like this. But we'll go ahead and move on to Triceratops, which is the next page. It's, a, it's an interesting design. Of course, they do have the elephant-like feet. Ceratopsians had very interesting looking feet where they had like three toes in the front uh, with nails on them and then two kind of vestigial toes kind of hanging off the back. They're very unique looking feet, very interesting looking feet. Um, this Triceratops has, you know, it's a decent skull shape. On the frill, it does possess epicipitals, uh, which, little fun fact here, those epicipitals were present on Triceratops just when it was younger. Triceratops is one of those dinosaurs that we have a pretty decent growth stage, or a pretty decent, like, growth chart of the animal, starting from a very young individual to, of course, more fully grown ones. And one thing to note is that they do possess those epicipitals when they are you know, young, when they're babies, but they slowly lose them, like they slowly get fused to the frill as they grow, and once they're mature, it's a completely flat frill. So basically, if you ever see a Triceratops with epicipitals, it's a younger individual rather than being a fully grown one. Just a little fun fact there. And then we have the iconic Iguanodon. Um, Iguanodon, of course, being one of the first ever dinosaurs discovered is probably pretty important for some dinosaur books. Um, it has an interesting design, all things considered. It's not not really that bulky compared to what Iguanodon it was. And its forelimbs are very, very short and small. Um, incredibly notable that Iguanodon had huge, thick uh, forearms with giant thumb spikes that were just perfect for like bringing down vegetation or defending themselves or something like that. You know, they're very powerful arms. And also I'll note the fingers, the fingers are kind of like individualized, like separated from each other being really thin. Thin. In reality, they were a little bit more fused, kind of making like a single pad on its hand. Uh, they're very interesting looking, but yeah, that's 
It's a very interesting looking iguanodon, but it's very cool that you have it. And that's pretty much it. That is dinosaurs. Um, this certainly just feels like a book that was made simply because dinosaurs are cool and dinosaurs will probably sell. I, I have no idea where I got this book. I don't know how old I was when I got this book. All I know is that I've always had it. <laughs> so it's just been something that's been around. Um, very interesting book. You probably wouldn't get a lot of paleontological information out of it. You probably wouldn't get a lot of entertainment out of it. It's just... You know, I'm sure that there are some decent facts. Like I, you know, there were a few that I mentioned, but for the most part, this book is either outdated information or information that just isn't sound at all. Yeah, that was that was dinosaurs. And that's pretty much all I have for this video. Um, I have been extremely busy busy as of late. Uh, my family and I have been moving into our brand new uh, brand new place, and I I just got my recording area set up. Um, got some Christmas lights set up. I was gonna turn them on. But um, it's like really dark outside and like I had a lot of lens flares on the camera, so I ain't gonna do that right now. I'll have to figure that part out. But I hope to continue getting, I hope to continue to get YouTube videos out. I mean, there's a, like, a, it's slowed down a little bit because again, we've just been so busy. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely doing my best to get as many out as I possibly can. Of course, the very next Many Interpretations of video, which is, is very popular on my channel, is going to be Parasaurolophus. That is definitely going to be a fun one. Um, so certainly stay tuned for that. But thank you guys so much for watching and have an awesome day.